So there is this game theoretic uh, problem between different labs where they all want the government to step in, make it illegal to develop superintelligence, but they want to be the ones with the most advanced system at the time it happens. So they all continue development until everyone else stops. Coming up on British thought leaders Roman Yampolsky says we're only a couple of years away from AI superintelligence that will endanger humanity and that the companies behind this technology know how dangerous it is. All of them are on record as saying there is a good chance it will create existential problem for humanity. But once they ended up in this position where they are leading a for-profit organization, all of a sudden they learn to ignore their own concerns. Roman says leaders in tech and AI are speaking out to stop AI development before it's too late. Well, I don't really care about career moves. I want to say what is actually true scientifically. And at the time, there was very few people who even looked at the problem. Today, we have Nobel Prize winners, Turing Award winners, thousands of computer scientists all agreeing with me. So it is not a fringe position. That is a majority position. Welcome to British Thought Leaders. I'm Lee Hall. Today I'm sitting down remotely with AI safety expert and author Professor Roman Yalpolsky. Roman, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. So a couple of years ago, you and hundreds of other leading tech figures signed this open letter calling for a pause to training powerful AI systems. Uh, the letter said they pose profound risks to humanity. I mean, what are those risks? What are the risks from developing super intelligent systems we don't know how to control, we don't understand how they work, and we have no idea what they're going to do to us? It's very hard to predict. They're smarter than us. I can tell you what a psychopath can do, a crazy person, but we really can't specifically guess what a much more intelligent agent would be capable of doing. I mean, where are we on the timeline to creating this AGI super intelligence that's beyond us? If we listen to the leaders of top AI labs, they are telling us that within a year or two, they're going to get to AGI. We're getting similar numbers from prediction markets. So it would be very surprising if within three to five years, we didn't have something like that. So I mean, the key problems that we don't really know what it's going to do and we can't control it, basically. Right. So there is a few things we would like to be able to do, and that's kind of part of my research. Uh, can we explain how the systems actually learn and perform, not just in general sense, but in terms of specifics? Can we predict what a smarter agent would do? Can we control it either in terms of direct control or in terms of delegated control? For all those, uh, there are well-known limits to what is possible. So have there been examples of AI systems going a bit rogue, doing something unexpected? So relative to the capability of a system, there are hundreds of examples of failures. The system designed to do X usually fails to X. So the trivial example would be you have a spell checker in your phone, it autocorrected to the wrong definition to the wrong word, something you dictate it all the time. And we're kind of used to that. Your spam uh, catching agent in your email folder redirects important email to a junk folder. So those are trivial things. We're all used to them. But they are problematic within the context of capabilities of that agent. Now, what if your agent is capable of doing a lot more and it fails in a similar way? So there's this term called P-Doom, which is the probability of existentially catastrophic outcomes from AI. And once we have this AGI superintelligence, what do you see as the probability of doom and how long would it take? Right, so the important part is how long. If you ask for a very short-term interval, what is the P-Doom for next month, it's probably not that high. But if we keep developing new systems, we're constantly re releasing new models. So you have your GPT-5 coming out, then 6, 7, 24. Uh, it's an ongoing process. Essentially, we need to always be a couple steps ahead. We always need to make sure there are no problems, no accidents. It becomes a perpetual safety problem, kind of like a perpetual motion device. 
uh, I don't think we can do it indefinitely. So the longer you wait, the higher your PDOOM gets, eventually hitting very close to a guaranteed event. So what would we say, say 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, what would that value be? I think it's approaching 100% over those time frames. Really? So pretty much definitely we will get wiped out by this superintelligence? Unless something new comes out where we have a reason to think we can control those systems, and so far no one has mathematical proof, paper, not even a blog post suggesting they know how to indefinitely control smarter than human systems. So, I mean, other experts have put this PDOOM value at 10%, 20%, 50%. I mean, what would you say to people who, who accuse you of fear-mongering? I think it's a realistic estimate of how dangerous this technology is. Uh, there is not enough fear, if anything. You bring up example of people who have 10% as a PDOOM. That's insanely high. That is betting all of humanity on one in 10 chance of us being destroyed so a corporation can increase profits. That is unacceptable. So would you say people working in AI are putting being technological leaders, making progress or even profit above the safety of others? Uh, definitely. We, we see it all the time. If we look at their public statements before they became CEOs, before they became leaders of those labs, they all acknowledged that AI safety is a big problem. They had very significant concerns about AGI and superintelligence. All of them are on record as saying there is a good chance that will create existential problem for humanity. But once they ended up in this position where they are leading a for-profit organization, all of a sudden they learn to ignore their own concerns. Yeah, as a member of the public, I kind of imagine these people working in AI are regulated, there's a legal framework they're working within, and they wouldn't really do things that would cause massive danger. Is that just a, a naive outlook? So first, there is absolutely no regulation for what you allow to do on your computer in terms of programming. You can program any agent you want and no one will stop you. Uh, if that was not the case and some laws were passed limiting what is possible to do, we have no capability to meaningfully monitor or test those models. It takes years to fully understand what a model is capable of. We still discover new capabilities and new bugs in old models released a long time ago. But there's very little media talk about this. The public don't seem to be worried about it. I mean, why is there no concern? Well, there is a lot of talk about it, a lot of podcasts and interviews, and the public is actually a lot more concerned than the experts. If experts have 10% concern, public is well over 50%, and most prefer that we don't develop superintelligent systems to replace them. Do you think it's a case of, for, for some people, it's not kind of on our doorstep, so we're not too worried at the moment, and maybe by the time people are very concerned, it will be too late? So we're talking about within a year or two. That is literally maybe too late at this point to do anything. The problem is, for most average people, there is not much they can do. Even if they completely accept this reality, uh, what are they going to do to make a difference? So you know, how can we stop this disaster from happening? If we had some self-interest, most of us would not try to develop a system which will replace us and possibly kill everything we care about. But again, you have this prisoner dilemma situation where while it benefits everyone to not do a dangerous thing, individually you may get financial benefit from being the last one to stop. So there is this game theoretic uh, problem between different labs where they all want the government to step in make it illegal to develop superintelligence, but they want to be the ones with the most advanced system at the time it happens. So they all continue development until everyone else stops. Really? So you'd say they actually want to be kind of stopped from doing what they're doing, but they can't draw out of the competition? Right. So if they stop unilaterally, they lose investors, they lose their dominant share of the market, so they would be replaced as a CEO of a profit corporation. They can't do that. They need an external external force government regulator to come in and uh, regulate them, even if it's just security theater. Uh, otherwise, uh, they have to be at the cutting edge and cut corners in terms of safety to develop a more capable model 
and we see it in news reports. I think there are whistleblowers now saying OpenAI has significantly cut their testing and safety budget. So as a kind of ordinary Joe, it's quite hard to understand who these people are that would you know, keep going with something that they know could endanger the entire, entirety of humanity. I mean, what kind of people are they? Well, very ambitious. I mean, if you're talking about creating God and controlling future light cone of the universe in terms of economic value, this is this is very ambitious people. But uh, it's not surprising. We have historical examples of people developing technologies which, at the time, they were not sure if they're going to destroy the world or not. Nuclear weapons is a great example. So is there a kind of possibility of somehow stopping the development, maybe governments could step in or something like that? So it's definitely better to add additional overhead, maybe legal overhead. The companies need to deal with uh, legal hoops they have to jump through where part of their compute budget goes to lawyers. That would slow down the process. I don't think long term it will actually completely stop this. But uh, one thing we need more of is time for sure. I mean, how realistic is it in stopping this? I guess some of the companies wouldn't really like it. I mean, what obstacles would there be? I think it's probably impossible to actually stop this. If one jurisdiction does a good job with it, they just move to a different jurisdiction. It's an international problem. There are so many different countries with different regulations. Even if uh, leaders of this uh, technology, US, China, had a complete uh, moratorium in place, other places would quickly take over. So would it just drive things underground, really, or maybe to some countries that don't comply? So it really depends on the size of the compute effort. If we're talking about something as large as Manhattan Project effort, billions of dollars of servers and training, it's a lot easier to notice and monitor. If a smaller model can be trained with a lot less resources, and we saw examples of it coming out of China, it becomes much harder to notice and regulate necessary processors, compute, available to those efforts. I've also read about the AI centers. A lot of them, they need tremendous amounts of power, tremendous amounts of water to, to run things. So I guess that also kind of limits things somewhat. Right, that's another tool we can use to limit uh, the larger projects. Uh, but uh, this technology becomes more, a lot more efficient very quickly. So if today it takes a billion dollar center to train a model, Next year, it may be 100 million, the year after it's 10 million, and so on, until everyone can do it on their laptop. So, you've devoted your career to AI. You obviously don't just want to see it completely wiped out. I mean, what do you see as an acceptable level? Where do we draw the line to how to use it? The soonest we can stop is today. The technology we have today is already more powerful than an average person in terms of their knowledge and capabilities. It has not been actually deployed to the economy. We can automate probably half of the jobs. We can get billions, trillions of dollars of free labor, cognitive labor out of those systems. And that has not been priced in. It is not already something monetized. So for the next 10, 20 years, we can just continue deploying existing models and see economy in a hyper growth mode. So kind of keep going with what we've already got. We don't need to take it any further, basically. Deploy it. So we saw it with other technologies. For example, video phones were invented in the 70s. It wasn't until iPhone came out that people started actively using FaceTime and things of that nature. So it took 20, 30 years to, to get there. And it's the same with those models. The model coming out today will not be in a factory, will not be in a taxi for many years. And until it is, it is not fully integrated with the economy. It is not monetized. I mean, you've created a, a career in AI, you're kind of well known in the field. I mean, probably they're saying it's dangerous and that we need to stop it. It's probably not the, the best career move. I mean, what, what's driving you to do that? Well, I don't really care about career moves. I want to say what is actually true scientifically. And at the time, there was very few people who even looked at the problem. Today, we have Nobel Prize winners, Turing Award winners, thousands of computer scientists all agreeing with me. So it is not a fringe position. That is a majority position. If you survey any large machine learning conference, you get a consensus that, yes, 
this technology is going to get to human level. Yes, it is dangerous and PDOOM levels are like 30% for AI researchers. So is it enough? Do you feel there's enough of a kind of surge of support for putting a cap on things to kind of save us? There is enough talk and agreement. There is not enough action. Okay. What kind of action would you like to see? Well, for one, nobody should actually be working on developing super intelligent systems. You literally getting us all killed. So there's several types of risk when it comes to AI. One is X risk, which we've been talking about, this existential risk. There's also S risk and I risk. And can you tell us what S risk is and give us some examples of that? Right. So some people are worried about even worst case scenarios, such as uh, suffering risks. You're not just uh, dead, but for some reason, those systems took over and placed humanity in a position where we are so unhappy, we would prefer to be dead. So kind of digital hell equivalent. Uh, ikigai risks or I risks are about meaning. You may be around, but the things you care about are no longer permissible for you to do either explicitly or implicitly. All the art, all the poetry, all the games, everything is no longer something humans can partake in because either there is competition for those jobs or there is just no economic support for it. So right now a lot of people get meaning out of their careers. You are a journalist, uh, somebody could be a medical doctor, but if all that is automated, all those jobs are gone, a lot of standard sources of meaning for humans disappear. And so you may still have some unconditional financial support from taxing all the robot labor and AI, but uh, you don't have any meaning to it. So now we need to figure out what to do with all that free time for billions of people. And a lot of people don't do well without structure where they have some outside purpose to their existence. I mean, X risk and S risk are not there, but with this I risk, we're seeing already so much AI art, it kind of floods your timeline on social media. I mean, you look at a photo or a video, you don't really know, like, is this real? Did it come from AI? You kind of have a feeling of mistrust. I mean, are we already in the kind of I risk zone? In a certain way, yes. There are quite a few jobs. Uh, basic design is one where you no longer can contribute. AI will do a better job quicker, faster, and we'll see it spread to everything else. Books, movies, all the creative outputs of people. We also have this kind of transhumanism happening, for example, Neuralink and things like that. Can you talk to us a bit about your, your thoughts on that? Right. So right now, while those systems are still tools. They are not full agents. They are not smarter than you. Having a direct connection between your brain and a computer gives you an advantage. You have access to internet. You can communicate very quickly. It's an improvement. But at some point, that tool becomes better than you, smarter than you. It's a full-blown agent. And at this point, you become a biological bottleneck. What are you contributing to the system if it is more capable? It's not obvious that you have anything to contribute. You just slow it down. So either explicitly or implicitly, you are removed from this hybrid system. You're also kind of opening up a back door to your brain for a system which could be malevolent, which is, again, leading to possible S risks. Finally, what, what gives you hope for the future? Well, there is always a possibility that I'm wrong. Maybe tomorrow someone will come out and publish a beautiful proof showing that, yes, you can control super intelligent systems indefinitely, and here's how we can do it, and then it's all glorious utopia for everyone. It's also possible there could be difficulties in creating systems which are that capable. It doesn't seem likely right now, but maybe there is uh, additional inventions we need to make and it will take longer to get to that point. So there is some hope. It's also possible that for game theoretic reasons, those systems will decide to play nice for a long time, accumulating power, trying to get us to respect them, trust them, even if later on they decide to perform a treacherous turn against humanity. Professor Raman Yampolsky, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me.